introduce uh, the message for today. I don't know if you're familiar, Shakespeare wrote a comedy called Much Ado About Nothing. I don't know if you've read it, seen a movie of it, uh, in there is a character named Benedict. Benedict is a kind of curmudgeon of love who sees nothing but trouble in women and vows to die a bachelor. But he meets his match with a woman named Beatrice who disdains men as much as he disdains women. They are both extremely witty and they go at each other with insults in the best way possible. And they are at each other and they are sharp. They have insults toward and against each other, but their friends decide to play a little trick on them. Their friends concoct a plan first to convict, convince Benedict that Beatrice is actually madly in love with him. And her friends convince Beatrice that Benedict is actually madly in love with her. So all appearances are they despise each other, they despise their race, and yet all of the sudden they become convinced that the other actually is passionately in love with them. Once they believe themselves to be loved, they immediately begin to love. Benedict, in his pronouncement speech of a newly transformed heart, makes a profound statement. Let me give you a little bit of the context. He be, in the middle of his speech, let me just pick it up. You need to read it if you haven't, but... I may chance, he says, have some odd quirks and remnants of wit broken on me because I have railed so long against marriage. But doth not the appetite alter? A man loves the meat in his youth that he cannot endure in his age. Shall quips and sentences and these paper bullets of the brain awe a man from the career of his humor? And here comes the powerful statement, no, no, the world must be peopled. Now, I don't know if Shakespeare had Genesis 128 in his mind when he wrote this, but somehow, from the very beginning, in a context of passionate love being overwhelmed with a newly found love in his heart, he throws out this fantastic statement, all of a sudden jumps to populating the entire earth because He's come to love one person. In Genesis 1, in the garden, when God presents the woman to the man, and he says, wow, there she is now, someone suitable, a real helper for me. And then God gives them this commission as he marries them, go be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. When God acts in love toward his people, somehow, for some reason, he has the population of the world in his mind. Benedict, when it dawns on him that he's actually in love with Beatrice, what comes out of his mouth, what dawns on him, some fantastic grand scheme about populating the entire world. Well, while I'm on the subject, could I just add Happy Mother's Day? Thank you, ladies, for populating the world. Thank you for doing your small part in populating the earth. It's a day to celebrate you and to honor you and thank you for your very, very important role. Nevertheless, Nehemiah chapter 11 is not about having babies. Nehemiah chapter 11 is about populating a city. Nehemiah chapter 11 is seemingly a very uninteresting chapter. It's quite boring. It is one of those chapters that's filled with a long list of names that half of them, none of us can pronounce. It's a little tedious to read through. Uh, but I find that sometimes when there are so many details that somehow get past us, do not necessarily grab our attention very well, that what can make it exciting is to back up and see why those details are there and what is the context of those details given to us in Nehemiah 
chapter 11 and step back and see the broader and grander scheme, the big picture. What's happening in our account through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, God has brought back a people who, by losing interest in God, have lost everything. They were God's people. They lost interest in who God was and drifted away from him. They forgot about him, did not worship him, did not honor him. And in so doing, lost everything they had. They lost the land. They lost their temple. They lost their homes. They lost their very identity. But by the time we're in Nehemiah chapter 11, God has been at work restoring everything to these people. He's brought them back to their homeland. He's provided a temple for them now to worship in yet again. At this point, the city walls have been rebuilt and their identity is being restored. They are in the process of being recipients of an unusual kind of grace and love from the Lord. And it is all coming back. And when we reach Nehemiah chapter 11, the message is something like this. God has established his holy city, and it is meant to be peopled. It's time to populate the city. Let's read just a couple verses together. If you do have a Bible, and this will be on the screen, I want to jump back to chapter 7 and just read verse 4 together, and then we'll jump ahead to chapter 11 and read the first two verses. So this is Nehemiah 7, verse 4. The city was wide and large, but the people within it were few, and no houses had been built. And now over to chapter 11, first two verses. Now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city while nine out of ten remained in the other towns. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. Will you just pray with me? Spirit of God, I ask that you would open wide our hearts, speak through this text, and me, a servant, a spokesman for you this afternoon, Fill our hearts with the joy and the purpose of being the people of God. And the joy and the purpose of seeing your city full of people from all nations. Put this in our heart. Grab hold of our souls with it, Lord, to see the glory of it and the joy of it in this seemingly uninteresting chapter. For your glory. Amen. The message is going to be outlined like this. The city is the plan. Second, the city must be peopled. And then we'll have a third point from there. Let's start with God's plan is a city. A city, that's God's plan. A, a city, can I just ask you a question? How, how do you feel about the city? How do you feel about cities? You live kind of in L.A. You live in one of the most densely populated areas on the planet how do you feel about the city a variety of perceptions some of us have a very romantic view of the city the city has a lot to offer we love the city i love the city and there's so much to do so much to see so much to occupy your interest and so there's a lot of value in the city but there's probably a few of you that have a little bit of a disdainful view of the city as well. Cities have much good to offer, which attracts people, but cities can also be filled with trouble. And that often makes people want to leave them. Because when you gather a bunch of people together and bad things happen and you see lots of the city, it tends to taint our view. Can I talk a little bit about God's view of cities? The biblical term from the very beginning in the Hebrew simply means a place where people are kind of densely populated together, typically with a wall around them. That's all it takes to be a city. Get a group of, it could be a, just a thousand people, 
living close together, put a wall around them, and the Bible would say, now that is a city. They were places of security. They were places of help. They were places of supply. You would go to the city in order to be safe and secure. They were places where people would become civilized. That word civilized means cityfied. Like you come together and you, you learn how to be civil with one another. You learn how to live in close proximity with other people. You get civilized because we're close now. We have to live together. And so we have to learn how to make that work and how that needs to function well. And so in the city, all kinds of good advances and improvements come about for the well-being of society. Justice, services, art, education, etc. Good things can and often do happen when people live closely together. Problems get solved. People think about the problems that are happening because we're together and they solve problems and they advance things and much good takes place. But of course, putting a lot of sinners together in a densely populated area and putting a wall around them can create lots of trouble as well. Crime. What did you think of when I said, what do you think about cities? Did crime, was that the first thing that came uh, in, into your mind? Certainly when you get a lot of people together, what's wrong with people can get amplified and can get multiplied. The Bible actually deals with two kinds of cities. But St. Augustine wrote a book called City of God. And in that book, he grabs these two biblical concepts, naming one the city of man and the other the city of God. In other words, there's two kinds of cities. In God's view, there's two kinds of cities. And the difference between the two has all to do ultimately with who is ruling the city and what is in the hearts of its citizens as far as the allegiance to that ruler. And when you start at the beginning of Genesis and you get to Genesis chapter 11, you're introduced to one of the earliest cities, Babel. It becomes Babylon. This, this is the quintessential city of man. In Genesis chapter 11, People gathered together, densely populated, came together and says, let us build a tower so that we might make a name for ourselves. There you have it. There's the underlying statement of the city of man. We are doing this for ourselves. We are doing it to make a name for ourselves. And therein you have the foundation of what plays out throughout all of history to this very day, the city of man. Of man. In contrast to that, God raises up his people and establishes a city called Jerusalem, referred to as the city of God. In the text that we read, the holy city, a city set apart for God. The difference is in who's governing the city and what's in the heart of the people. I don't know if you realize this or piece this together, but God's plan, God's redemptive plan, the overall plan is for a city. That's where it's going. He's got an entire redemptive plan leading up to a city, a place densely populated that is secure, full of provision and protection, where each of his residents can thrive and enjoy life. His city exists where his people live gladly under his reign that could describe the city of God. The vision was spoken of when referring to Abraham in the book of Hebrews. He was one man, and with his family, God had set out on a journey to go and look for a place. Now, here's how the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11, verses 8 through 10, tells this part of the story. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. He went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward 
to the city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. Now you have a description of the city of God. He's looking for a city, a densely populated place, securely put together that God himself has laid the foundations for and is himself the ruler of, the governor of. And all of God's redemptive work culminates in Revelation 21 about this final and ultimate city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. There it is, the ultimate end game of what all God's Spirit is at work doing in your life, in my life, throughout the planet, throughout humanity, is leading up to that grand new Jerusalem, a city that comes down, a place where God and man dwell together in God's presence. It's a city. The Bible starts in a garden and ends in a city. The chapter in Revelation goes on to describe what life is like in this city. There are no more tears, no more sorrow. It talks about all the glories of the city. And in particular, in Revelation 7, 9, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne. Okay? A city with a population you cannot count. It's so big. There are so many people. And who is there? Oh, people from every walk of life, every nation, every tribe, every ethnic group, on the planet. Every language is represented there. There's someone from everyone around this throne living in this ultimate city. That's the plan. The plan is a city, a city like that. Well, the second point is that God's city must be peopled. The city must be peopled. That's what's happening. That's what's going on. And that's what Nehemiah chapter 11 is about. It's about populating the city of God. Now, Jerusalem is just a shadow of what God plans for the future, but an important shadow, an important display of what God is doing at that point in history. A city that was wide and large, but the people within it were few, as we read back in chapter 7. God's vision for the city was at this point missing the most important part. People. Lots of people. That's God's vision. And so he establishes this city. He orchestrates all of history, including the king of Persia. And the city gets rebuilt. And the people move down and they're living around. And now we have a city, but we don't have the people. And it's time to people the city. The real glory of the city was not in its building or its walls, but the real glory of the city of God is in the hearts of its residents, its citizens, its people, who are there gladly living under the reign of the Lord. There because they love the Lord. There because they belong to the people of God and their allegiance is to the Lord. People who long for and love being in God's presence and living under his care and under his authority, these make up the city of God. In the story, way back when, when they forsook this, the city ended up in ruins. So it was when the people's hearts drifted away from the Lord, the city ended up in ruins. The temple was ransacked and destroyed. Okay, so clearly God's priority was not the buildings or the walls. 
He has vision for a city with people in it. People who love the holy city. That's the vision. In order for the city to function, in order for this holy city to function as it was meant to, many more people were needed. We have this kind of strange picture in the beginning, the two verses that we read. They cast lots for people to move into the city. We've got thousands of people living outside the city. We've got a big city, very few homes, very few people. Okay, people of God, here's what we're going to do. We're going to cast lots, and one out of ten of you is going to have to make a move and relocate inside the city. The city must be peopled, and it's our responsibility to people it, and so we're going to cast lots, and you are going to come in, one out of ten. The text also mentions volunteers, how grateful they were that some people volunteered. Now, the text is not really clear if those are two different groups. Did we just cast lots and pick one out of ten and like it or not? You're coming in the city. Oh, and then there were a handful of people that volunteered, and you can come into the city as well. Maybe they were the same. So maybe we say to Young and Faith, and okay, you get your lot falls on you, you're moving in the city, and Young says, I'm not moving to the city. But he sends a couple of his daughters and says, You guys go inside the city. But if Young said, Absolutely, I willingly come, then we say, Well, thank you for volunteering to come into the city. So we don't really know how this played out. If the lots and the volunteering were kind of one and the same or two separate things. But we see here casting the lot was kind of an acceptable way of deciding or understanding or learning or discerning God's will. So we kind of throw the dice, and we trust that God is speaking through these dice to tell us who's in and who's out. So there's an aspect of looking to the sovereignty of God in this. And then we have the volunteer saying, and I will gladly come and relocate and move my family inside the city. The sovereign hand of God at work, in and through, populating the city, and the people's will and desire of transformed hearts, saying, take me, Lord, I'm yours. I will go where you say go. I will live where you want me to live. Both those things working in tandem to populate the city. Every person who was part of the people of God had a place. And if we were to take the time and read through the chapter, there'd be categories of leaders and priests and Levites and temple attendants, and each would have a list of names, and these were the people that were moving into the city, occupying the city. There was one out of ten that would move in. There were nine out of ten that would stay outside the city walls. Those people would keep the farms, maintain an economic balance, for all of life. They would enter into the city for times of celebration and times of worship and times of commerce, but they would live and reside outside the city. We get a, just a little glimpse of this city in Jerusalem, which is something as we fast forward into the life of the church, is that, friends, every one of you, every member of the body of Christ has a place, has a role to play, Every member fits somewhere. We need everyone. We need some inside the city doing this. We need some fulfilling this role. We need others fulfilling that role. But the reality is God is peopling the city. God is gathering his people, and he has a place and a role and a function, and it's important for every individual. And if we were to take the time and read the list of names, and I would go through the embarrassing task of trying to pronounce them, you would realize, well, these, these names, they don't really mean much to you or to me. They don't say much. Why, why should we spend time reading them? But, but if your name was on the list, or your father's name, or your grandfather's name was on the list, you'd probably hear the list a little bit differently. I mean, it's uninteresting to us because we don't know these people. But we can read the list of names and at least realize this. These were actual people with names. These were real people on the roll, called forward. God was speaking out their name and saying, I want you to live inside the city. I want you to live here. I want you to function in this role. 
you know, friends, it's, it's one thing to know, and I'm assuming most of you in the room have heard this so many times. God loves the whole world, and he gave his son to die for our sins. If you trust him, you can be freed from your sins and forgiven. We've all heard that a number of times. But most of us in the room have had the encounter and the experience where I said, God loves the whole world. And some work of the Spirit took place in your heart, and all of a sudden that God loves the whole world came down to, and that includes me. And somehow in that, you hear your name. It's not just a list of names you don't know. It's not just a grand, there's a mass of people that God loves or the whole world that God loves. All of a sudden, in a moment, it's like the list, your name, you see, all of a sudden, your name, it's your name there. It's you. It's not just everybody. You're part of that. And that makes all the difference. You're a transformed Benedict or Beatrice at that point. You were just bestowed upon love. They were deceived into thinking that they were loved. And that, that's all it took to change their hearts. But you and I can know. In the grandest expression of God's love. When he willingly sends his son. To condescend. To take on human form. Step into our world. Take on our likeness. Walk on the earth that we walk on. Eat the food that you and I eat. Suffer the troubles and traumas of this world. And go through it on our behalf. And lay down his life. And when you realize that his willingness to suffer and die was motivated out of an extraordinary love. And when you fill in the blank of that extraordinary love for you, your name, you've just been overwhelmed by an extravagant, divine love that changes and transforms your very soul. And you go from being a hater to a lover. And the love of God transforms our hearts. Third and final point is that you and I exist as God's means to people the city of God. City is the plan. That's what God's doing. The city must be peopled. The people are the most important part of the city. And friends, you and I are part. We are the means God will use to people the city of God. We are citizens already. If you're here and you're in Christ, you are citizens of the city of God. Nevertheless, here we are in L.A. We reside in the city of man. Apostolic teaching, James, Peter, when they address the churches, they refer to us, the church, as the dispersion, sometimes the exiles, the strangers, the resident aliens. Okay, that's how the New Testament apostolic teaching views you and me. That's our category. That's our citizenship. In other words, we have a dual citizenship. We are members of the city of God. We belong as members of the people of God. We are part of Christ's bride. At the same time, we reside, we live here in the city of man. We belong to the city of God. We reside in the city of man. Now, the people of Nehemiah's day were taught an unusually valuable lesson when it regards these two cities. The people in this book, in this chapter, 
came from being in exile. They lived in the quintessential city of man, the pagan land. That's where they were exiled to, and they had to reside there because they neglected following the Lord. They turned away from the Lord. When they were sent into Babylon, Jeremiah prophesied the word of the Lord and says, I want you to go there, and I want you to go there willingly. And when you get there, I want you to settle in, and I want you to live and seek the welfare of that city. The wrong city, the city of man. I want you to live and reside there and seek its welfare. In seeking its welfare, you will find your welfare. Well, okay, the message was far more strange to them, even as it is to you and me. They said, what? Could it be? Yes, absolutely. That's what God is calling you to do. We are portrayed as the people of God temporarily living in the city of man, just like these people living in Babylon were the people of God living in the midst of the city of man. Not only did they experience the difference between the two cities, they could begin to see God's purpose for them as the people of God. Whether living in Babylon or now living in Jerusalem, their purpose was to live as the people of God and for their lives together as the people of God would be a witness to the people, not the people of God that the nations around would see, that the residents of Babylon would see what it means to be the people of God. God's purpose is that through our identity as the people of God, we demonstrate to the world what a society can be like under God's lordship. That's what we're doing here. That's what we belong to. That's our purpose. We are supposed to live together as the people of God and function as a society in order for everyone around, our community around Southern California, the world, to be able to see what a society can be under God's lordship. This is what it looks like. We are the happiest people in the world to live under God's lordship. We love being in God's presence. We love doing God's will. This is the greatest thing. This is our most secure place. He cares for us. He provides for us. His great act of love convinced us that, that he is for us. And so we enjoy nothing more than to be together as the people of God. And that is what is meant to be displayed for the rest of the world to see. Psalm 48. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. The joy of all the earth, okay? What we celebrate together as a local church, as the people of God, what we have is the joy of all the earth. And you and I are meant to be together and live that out and express that and communicate that and proclaim that. The love of God that we have in Christ Jesus, that is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. Okay, in conclusion, how do you feel about cities now? My goal is not to get you to love L.A. That's a little too ambitious for me, I'm sure. I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that, that loving Los Angeles or loving Pasadena is the key to you and I being effective in what God has called us to. I think the key is how much you and I love being residents of the city of God. If we're trying to figure out and learn, you know, how to do what we're called to do in order to be the witness that God wants us to be, I think the key is not to fixate on 
a town, a city, a location, a county, an area. But to be so consumed, so overwhelmed, so glad-hearted, so filled with joy, so filled with willingness to, that, that sacrifice means, means nothing to us that because we are part of the city of God. We are the people of God. We live under his reign, under his rule, under his protection, under his care, under his love. God's plan is to form a city, a new Jerusalem. The building is already underway here in this room with you and with me. We're, we're somewhere in the process of God moving us, gathering us, forming us, putting a wall around us, making us secure, and moving us towards that great city. And the city, the city is large, and there's lots of room. There's so much room for so many people. Because when it's all said and done, it, I mean, if the Bible tells us you can't count how many people are there, I mean, that's got to mean something. The Bible has some very large numbers in it. But when the Bible runs out of vocabulary, runs out of zeros, and starts saying, look, okay, we, we, there are just so many there we can't even count. I, I think the message we're supposed to get is that there's lots of room in the city of God. And you and I get to have a part in peopling it in adding to it. We live surrounded by potential residents of that city. People in your neighborhoods, in your workplaces, people that you rub shoulders with. You're all potential citizens of that new Jerusalem. And you don't really know who they are. But you're not supposed to necessarily know who they are. You're supposed to assume that everybody needs to hear about that new city and about the joy of what it means to be the people of God and how wonderful and glorious it is to be in the city of God. James Montgomery Boyce wrote a wonderful book called Two Cities, Two Loves, a sort of a modern-day version of Augustine's City of God. And early in the book, he says, what Christians need to do above all is to be Christians. That is, to be God's people in the midst of this world's culture. If you have a full, clear, biblical understanding of what it means to follow Christ, then you've got it. What are we supposed to do in this culture? We're supposed to fight culture wars. Uh, let, let's, just, let's just start here. Listen. The first thing, the main thing, the primary thing, be a Christian. Be who you are. This glad, grateful, rejoicing, loving Jesus, love to worship, love to serve, glad to obey. Be who Christ has made us. If we're going to display the glory of living under God's rule, then, well, let's live under God's rule and realize the joys and the glories of it. It really is the best, most glorious way to live. He's for us. He's with us. He's designed a, a, a way, a life for us to enjoy him and know him. Practically, worship team, you can come on up. I'm just about finished. I invite you to pray for us in, in less than two weeks, the week after next, week from Thursday, the pastors and our wives are going to go away for a few days, and we're going to have an evaluation and planning retreat. We do this every year. We set aside a few days, and we evaluate and we think through the life of the church. I'm particularly excited about this one because we have kind of a, a, a newly formed team, and we, we just, we sense in our hearts, we're just, we're well poised for the next season in the life of this church. And some of our thinking and our, and our planning is gonna be really 
trying to evaluate and discuss ways that we as a church can be involved in the peopling of God's city. How are we supposed to be involved in our community, in our society? What kind of expressions can we find as a local church to be involved with and to really, in a sense, make Christ known in the area that God has planted us as a church? Would you, would you pray for us? I think it's going to be a strategic time for us as a church. I'm, I'm just excited about what we're going to come out of that retreat with and move into in the coming months and into this coming fall and new church year. We ask and covet your prayers for that. It's a wonderful thing that God allows us to be a part of. Friends, the city of God must be peopled. You and I get to be a part of peopling it. I can't think of a better job for us to be a part of. I can't think of something more rewarding, more wonderful, more glorious than to be involved and work together to see people come to know this extraordinary love and grace of the Father in Christ. Let's stand together. Father, fill our hearts with this reality, I would say burden, but more so joy. The joy of what you're doing. Fill our hearts with the, with the vision of where you're taking things and what you're doing so that we don't get discouraged by seeing setbacks in the present day, but know, Lord, how faithful you are in what you're doing. So give us that faith of Abraham. We don't know all the details, but we're looking for that city whose maker and builder is God. Use us for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.